This is our hot take. A lot of folks really don't like this take, and if you don't, it's fine. I have no problem with that because I will argue until I'm blue in the face. Good to see you guys, our favorite uh, North Carolina partners. Always enjoyed working with you guys. For those that don't know, title industry, you're attorneys. And so you're doing all the stuff that we're doing up here throughout the entire transaction. And in North Carolina, we just issue title insurance. So we don't clear title, we don't order title searches. You guys handle it all. Yeah, you do that's, all the work. that's the hard part, right? We do the heavy lifting in North Carolina. <laughs> Exactly. And you guys are growing extremely fast. I love your culture. I love your vibe. We've really enjoyed working with you guys. What's the story on how you guys came together? Give me a little background, how the firm got us started, how you guys got connected. Yeah. So the firm reads is me. So I think you have to yeah. answer this one. So yeah, I've been, I've been practicing for about 12 years. I started out in general practice did a little bit of everything. Some stuff that you shouldn't have been doing. Some stuff I had no business doing, but did a little bit of everything down myself. And as time went on, I realized that the only area of law that really, that I could think of that involves people being happy and not being miserable, like, you know, it's not bankruptcy. It's not probate law. Like people dying is no fun. It's not family law, right? Like, people fighting. So for us, real estate law specifically is the one place where people walk in the door and they have a smile on their face. They're happy. They're getting to go through a positive life, big major life event. And so for us, for me specifically, it was the one area of law where I felt like I could actually really enjoy and thrive in that space and create an environment where, um, you know, other people got to enjoy that too. So. so after you did all the extra stuff, you sort of specialized here and that was eight years ago? Yeah, so about eight yeah. years ago, I kind of really got into the real estate side of stuff. I started, you know, I, I stopped going to bankruptcy court and I stopped messing around with all, all the other stuff and really kind of focused in on real estate. That's when Kelly and I met. Yeah, so I am a licensed real estate agent here in North Carolina and that's kind of my second career almost. I started as a professional educator and did that for about six, seven years and then had a note of that when I got my real estate license and Joe was actually my closing attorney. So Joe helped me with all of my buyers in the past and when he was looking to hire a practice manager, he called me up and I told him no. Um, but he was persistent enough that, uh, yeah, we finally worked it out and it's been almost five years of working together. Yep. So, so my, my role as practice manager is like my official title, but my job description is more like, yes. <laughs> Tell me about that. More like, yes. Give us some examples. Day to day for me looks like, oh goodness, it's everything from HR function to marketing function to operations. So I get to have my hands in a lot of different things. We've got a really dynamic team of about 30, a little over 30 people. So managing a team that large comes with its own challenges. And I can be found sometimes helping people with tech setup, or I can be helping with HR onboarding and training. Or sometimes I get to do my favorite part, which is actually out marketing the business, talking to people about why I think Atlas is special. We could definitely feel the culture and the vibe when we, we see your guys' videos, we see in your office. You know, I, that was one thing that we saw with the industry was it was a boring industry and you're buying a house and it should be a celebration. It should be fun. So yes, you've got to have attorneys that are great. You need to have the responsiveness because that's a way you can ruin that exciting celebration. But I mean, you guys really have done a great job with kind of creating that fun feel. Where did that come from? When we looked at the industry, as we've been working together for five years. A few years ago, we looked at the industry as a whole and went, why is it this way? And in our state specifically, um, I think it's like this in a lot of places across the nation, but definitely North Carolina. Attorneys are very similar kind of across the board. They're all kind of very stealthy. They're very like buttoned up. You walk into a closing, it's about an hour long of listening to the attorney talk about nothing, nothing that the clients care about. It's an old wood paneled room with books and mahogany shelves and the carpet smelly because it's old and everything. It's unapproachable. It's unapproachable. Yeah. Everything is set in the eighties. And you know, for us, we looked at that and went, why would it be this way? We are, we live in this world that is dynamic and fun and changing and like it seems like every other industry 
was changing with the times and ours was. And I mean, to add to that, the vast majority of folks that we work with on a daily basis, of course, we have a fiduciary duty to the buyer. Everything that we do is for the home buyer in North Carolina specifically. But we deal with these real estate agents and have awesome partnerships with them and get to see them sometimes even once a week. And we recognize that lender partners are adapting to meet the needs of those. And there are other, you know, technologies and softwares that are adapting to meet the needs of agents. So why aren't attorneys? And so we said, okay, well, instead of building a business that is centered around how things have always been done, let's build a business that makes life easier, not just for the home buyer, but also for the people we work with on a weekly basis. So virtually everything that we do, I think really comes from having a very clear set of values and being able to hold up every decision against those values really helps us say, yeah, that would be cool, but it doesn't really fit. The so um, I think that's been really the secret sauce to the success we've had. I love it. And where, where do you guys serve currently and how many offices? Yeah, so <laughs> this is our hot take. A lot of folks really don't like this take. And if you don't, it's fine. I have no problem with that because I will argue until I <laughs> them in the face. We only have one location. So our office is located in Kernersville, North Carolina. It's the heart of the triad, which is made up of three of our largest cities in the state. But we serve the entire state of North Carolina. So just because we're centrally located, we have groups and partnerships kind of across the state that allow us to serve. I mean, later this month, we're doing closings in Wilmington, Raleigh, Charlotte, uh, Garner area, all the way up in the mountains toward Boone, uh, toward the beach, Emerald Isle, which is really cool. So we're not geographically hindered. We get to do everything using technology and some of the other really nice stuff we've been working on. Yeah, our, our world has gotten so good black now, like that. It's so easy for us, even though we're physically located in one place, to really be anywhere in the state. We close stuff all over the state on a regular basis, and we love it. We have clients that are awesome, awesome clients that are out east that we have never physically in person met. And <laughs> they have closed you know, millions of dollars of deals with us, and yeah. they love us, and we love them. And they're almost like you know, family, they're close business partners, and... Everything that we do with them is via video when we have to chat with them and talk with them about updates. And then when they do their closings, they still get someone from our office actually physically there, which is really cool. So yeah. even though we haven't met them, they still have a really nice tie in with our office. My honestly, my favorite thing that has happened really over the past year of developing that has been partnerships with expansion teams. So um, especially brokerages like exp real broker you know some of these cloud-based brokerages there are groups of agents who are essentially referral partners or an office like a collective office but they serve multiple areas one of the biggest advantages to them using one law firm for all of their closings is they don't have multiple processes so their administrators their transaction coordinators their office staff get to work with one group in our office for all of their closings across the state uh, so that has been one of my favorite things to see come out of that because we've seen literally those teams able to double and triple their business because they're able to do less administrative work, which has just been huge for them and us. Hey, I like that take, number one. We do the same thing in Florida, Texas, Colorado. We have one office. We serve the entire state. And, you know, at the end of the day, what a lot of people don't understand is, you know, you're trying to survive in tough times when volume isn't as high. Yeah. And if you even if you find a good deal on an office, you still have to staff the entire office. And so like, that's a lot of times people just don't understand the massive costs that go into every single office. Yeah. They actually have five offices in the DMV. And like, I'm fortunate that we don't have 10 because some, <laughs> some title companies do. And you know, certain areas are different, right? And so here they kind they all do make sense, but in certain states, like other states we're in, we, we definitely agree with you on that. It's the right thing to do. Really early on, we realized the actual reason why we didn't want to have multiple offices actually has not a lot to do with costs. It has to do with firm culture. Mm -hmm. so. so it's not even external. It's really internal. So our reason for existing. 
Like the reason that we come to the office every day, get up in the morning and do what we do is not for paperwork. It's not for money. It's not really for anything other than the glory. Yeah, not for glory. (laughs) Definitely not the glory. But it is it's really about the the culture here. It's about the group of people that we've collected that we work with. Having multiple offices would not allow us the close relationships that we have with one another here and the teamwork that we've built and having multiple locations immediately would shut down some of that natural flow that we have. So we decided that that was not going to be something that we ever pursued um, unless something drastic changed. So we do, I mean, we have a good clip of folks in our office who are hybrid workers or remote workers, and we have other ways that they plug into our team, but we are a centralized location forever. <laughs> give, give me, you know, give me some of those examples of in the office, fun, teamwork, things you guys together do together to keep the culture and, yeah. you know, fun. The one that comes to mind the most, that's probably the most frequent is we have what we call an attitude adjustment. So typically after all of our closings are on record, everything has happened. It's toward the end of the day. Everyone's wrapping up, prepping for the next day. We'll all go grab a drink or a beverage of our choice and just kind of hang out in spaces, I mean, throughout the building. So you can very often, you'll have agents coming in to pick up their checks in the afternoon and you can hear us laughing, tell jokes, carrying on. Usually our agents will go grab a drink and join us, which is a lot of fun. I'd say probably my other favorite thing that happens really frequently is, I mean, Joe and I are obviously good friends outside of work. Joe comes to my kids' birthday parties. We're constantly involved in one another's lives. One of our teammates has a huge farm out in Walnut Cove, North Carolina, and she invited everyone out for farm day recently. We do baseball games together. There are all kinds of things that are always happening, like on the weekend. Yeah, yeah. Hours. and the, the really amazing thing for us, and I know I speak for both of us on this, is it's not. There's a lot. We do a lot of stuff like that that's formalized, like formalized where it's not just kind of ad hoc, but on a daily basis, like we're liable to get interrupted any minute with someone like <laughs> laughing too loud outside because yeah. it he, this place is raucous. It's a lot of fun. <laughs> like even in the um, you know in the trenches, you know, and when when it gets really busy and chaotic, people st- still have fun here. Atlas Arms. Give me the genesis of the name, how it came about. I want to tell the first part of the story. Okay. <laughs> Yeah, this is it's a fun, fun story, and we have to tell it a lot, and it's not a short story. So I don't think it can be shorter, but I have time. Let's go. He likes to hear himself talk. So um, the first part of the story is my favorite because a few years ago we decided we were going to rebrand, but we weren't sure how, and we decided that we were going to rebrand as a business that was not tied to the identities of our partner attorney. So obviously that is a trend in the law community. That's like a really standard naming practice. And so we said we wanted something that made people feel like they didn't know quite what business it was and they were curious about it, using it as a marketing technique. And so one of Joe's favorite books is Atlas Shrub. And so we kind of landed on Atlas Law. So we rebranded everything as Atlas Law, got our whole branding package put together, colors, logo, everything. It was awesome. We launched at the beginning of the year. And after two, three months, we got a really nice letter in the mail. Yeah, it was a cease and desist <laughs> letter from another attorney who didn't like us using the name. Basically, he hired an attorney, we hired an attorney. They're trademark attorneys, fighting attorneys over attorneys. <laughs> We we kind of got down to brass tacks with our attorney, like, hey, can we win? And he was like, yep, you got this. We're going to win this lawsuit. And I said, okay, but how much? And he told me enough. Cost conscious. Yeah, cost conscious, here. right? So how much? And he said, well, it's, it's going to cost you six figures. It's a federal lawsuit. It's trademark. It's probably going to be in a different state. It's- and I had the argument with Joe at that point. I was like, we are building a brand new business. We do not have time to get caught up in litigation. Like, let's just rebrand this thing. It's only been three months. We haven't ordered a ton of promo. We don't even have letterhead yet. <laughs> it's like, yeah. Let's not mess with it. And we'll just 
Keep so, staying right. Yeah, so we looked at the name and said, all right, Atlas Law. We wanted to keep the identity of Atlas. Some point in the process, started using the color orange in some of our branding. I looked at Kelly and was like, what if we called it Atlas Orange? At first, I think everybody hated it. I, everybody hated it. Everybody hated it. <laughs> and I started like working on it more, and then we fell in love with it. Mm -hmm. And honestly, it's one of the best things that's happened to us. When I think of the color orange, and when most of our team thinks of the color orange, we think of vibrancy and creativity and uh, being young. Enthusiasm. And enthusiasm and new experience. And... That was the energy that we wanted to bring to every single clothing. We've got a huge group of women and we have a really good time together. So we've got like orange water bottles, and yeah. we've got orange dresses. One of our pair of girls walked in today. She's wearing a literal like orange print dress. So it's just everywhere. And our signature party that we do as our client experience kind of appreciation party is called the Orange Party. You would think that I wore this hat in preparation for today's oh, wow. So, my podcast. Sure it's it's my favorite hat of i just got it from montana on a recent trip yeah and uh, it kind of it vibes well with this whole conversation it does. It does. i mean let me give you the true story i went to montana and then i bought it online afterwards that is a true story <laughs> actually this is this is the name of it. uh diamond cross oh jackson hole wyoming wyoming so it's not even montana even though i went to montana i'm now buying wyoming hats all right, now we're not going to cut that out. We're going to let people just know how embarrassing that was. We keep rolling with it. Not a big deal. You guys are doing a great job on social media and videos. Where do you come up with your content ideas? So this is kind of like a collective staff effort, honestly. Um, mm -hmm. Most of our staff is pretty young. Yeah. You're not the, you're not the oldest not thing. Not the oldest anymore. I used to be the oldest, which was a wild thing. It was so, really fun, honestly. Yeah, I'm in my 30s, but still was the oldest. Yeah. The, the really cool thing about it, honestly, we don't we have not hired anybody. So we don't have we something have new to house. It is it is the people here. We literally have a shared chat that's for ideas. And people as they run across them in their their lives as they're scrolling, you know, Instagram or on Facebook and they see something that looks funny and they have an idea, they pop it in the chat and then um, usually on a weekly basis, we'll do probably three or four videos and yeah. we'll just shoot them in house. And yeah. Anybody who knows anything about Instagram as a platform knows that they prioritize like independently made content. We love to take part in the trend. Do not get us wrong. Trends are hilarious and are engaging and funny. We very early decided that we were not going to use our platform as a primary mechanism of like education it's all strictly entertainment uh, yeah. a lot of the feedback that we get from our partners and people that we work with that see our instagram are like this is humanizing we yeah. love this because we get to see who is behind mm -hmm. the brand and we just leaned into that so much we actually have a, a wild story sort of about our social media and perfect let's hear it as we were launching atlas we, like really early days. like really early very beginning we had started our account and we were posting our first couple reels and our first couple videos and we posted a video that had profanity in it which if you're part of our office and you hear us every day you know that's part of our culture and mm -hmm. I mean, we are probably the biggest offenders mm -hmm. and we posted a video that had profanity in it it was one of my favorite kevin hart clips okay okay <laughs> if anybody is watching this episode and they want to go all the way back in the reels to find it it's pretty good it's an og clip so we posted this and we got some feedback. Someone texted Joe. Yeah, someone, someone I had known for years. And and, and gave him as a stuffy old attorney. Right. They, yeah. they knew me from, from prior days of being the buttoned-up professional attorney. And yeah. it, it, like, it was really interesting to hear from someone I trusted. Like, yeah, someone whose opinion we really valued. And she was like, hey, are you sure this is really the identity you're going for? Like, is this really what you want to be putting out there? And we had a moment where we kind of looked at each other and we had to really evaluate, is this the identity, right? Because you're going to piss some people off when you decide what you're going to be. Some people don't want the experience that we provide. Some people don't want the group of people that work in this office. Yep. And we collectively decided that that is A-OK -okay because we're really happy with the service we provide and the business that we have. Huh. And so that was kind of a like self-reflection moment of, ooh, 
do we really like it's okay to get criticism criticism is yeah. really important and in fact we get a lot of it yeah. and we hear from our regular partners and are able to make really important improvements frequently but that was one of the moments that yeah. cemented everything what was big for us is we didn't there was, it was kind of a decision that was like, all right, are we going to water this down and make it like appropriate? Or are we going to do, are we going to be genuine and be who we are? And yeah. I think we made the decision then we wanted to work with people who like us. I didn't want to work with someone who wanted a old law firm experience. Mm-hmm. Like that's not, that's not our problem. And there are people out there, there are agents and clients that we have lost over the years because that's what they like and that's fine i love where you're going with that we actually have this conversation all the time in fact you know we had someone be like how are we going to win the business of you know the 60 plus community or whatever and i was like look we aren't for everyone you know what i am proud of is when we do have those clients that work with us they do actually have a great experience they probably don't think they would but uh you know look we just don't have a lot of that clientele is just not ours. And so we kind of dive deep into who we are. Now we've had some times in our career where we're like, eh, what do we think about this video? Maybe it's a little, maybe it's a little too much. So we have a couple things on the sideline that have never been posted. Maybe one day we'll show some of you guys. And we do some educational stuff, but it's not, that's not the main point of it. And what we found is like the people we're connecting to, if we need to connect to them on an educational level, we'll, we're going to connect with them in that level. Mm-hmm. Like, Instagram is not the pl- place for me to explain things, cards and deeds right, and like how an estate works. Like that's that's not going to be helpful. An in-person like phone call or you know a mastermind meeting, like that's a good place for that. So we we try to be really really intentional about that. And it's the byproduct of it is we've been able to kind of build some firm culture around it. We've gotten, you know, buy-in from people around here. People who would never show up on camera before <laughs> now will. And, like, and it's fun. That's the thing is it, it legitimately is fun for yeah. us. So. One thing I've noticed, too, is, you're, you know, you're kind of always thinking, you mentioned client experience, you're always thinking about what else can we be doing to offer more value? I think you launched a product earlier in the year. Is it called Catalyst? Do you, Tell me more about that. Yeah. So just like you guys have Panda Bird Creative, of course, we are constantly evaluating. We have a lot of agents who are really good at a lot of things. They're damn good at marketing and they can close a deal. But when it comes to transactional paperwork, yeah. <laughs> yeah. it's yeah. kind of a hot mess it's... express sometimes. Yeah, we have. I mean, it was funny because over the years, Kelly and I have spent much time thinking about, all right, like, what can we do to help make our agents better so they can bring us more work and we can make more money, right? Like, it just makes sense from a business standpoint for yeah. us. And one of the things that we saw is we we have this core of agents who are brilliant. They're so good at, like, getting in front of clients and showing houses and doing the things that agents do best. Mm-hmm. They're great at selling. Once it's under contract, it's like we, we never we never hear from them again. Like we, uh, it's really really hard to get the stuff we need mm-hmm. like to be able to invoices, amendments, sure. making sure all yeah. all paperwork Very is familiar. And so I have a background as an agent, and I recognize that as a huge need. So we put our heads together toward the middle of last year and decided, why couldn't we, as an attorney's office, offer a transaction coordination concierge service? Like why couldn't we do that? And if we did, what the hell would it look like and how would we manage it? What that has done for our business has been kind of amplified across all of our teams because we saw these agents who were really good at getting the business yeah. and needed to be able to move on away from the administrative tasks to deal with the next thing. So we were able to take over that communication with the client and helping educate them and getting that sure. street on and also you know making sure all of their paperwork was being completed. And then, of course, I mean, with the NAR settlement and all the other things that have happened in the industry, we've also been able to create new workflows for those agents in getting new paperwork executed properly. There was just such a natural kind of mill between the attorney's office role and, like, the closing agent role and then stuff that's happening earlier in the transaction. And we saw, hey, like, we can really cut down and communication needs and we can really help our agents. It's really about getting from that contract point all the way to the closing day. One of the things that we see, especially newer agents or agents that kind of have a um, not a huge volume, 
Mm -hmm. right? And one of the things we really see is they struggle with the leverage because they have to do everything for themselves and they don't mm -hmm. have the wherewithal to train and, and implement, you know, coordination. Or even the bandwidth to be able yeah. to do that yeah. because they're so busy servicing the work. They, they get to this like natural hit their head on the ceiling and can't break past that number of transactions. So yeah. no, I completely get it. Are you seeing like some of these TCs are end up working on files that you guys aren't even doing? Does that end up happening? Um, or is it only on files that you guys are working on? It happens occasionally. We have some special disclosure requirements. Say we are, I mean, we have several real estate partners that we work with that are like, you are going to do everything from now on. Like, here, please pitch it. Um, and occasionally, you know, they'll have a buyer who's buying a new build and they have an affiliation elsewhere that we have to honor. Yeah. Or, you know, we'll have a lender that has an affiliation that we have to honor. And so, of course, we're still able to take those. It definitely makes things a little bit trickier. Yeah, I think even on the listing side, so we, we do this on the sales side, too. And in North Carolina, the buyer typically chooses the closing attorney. With all those transactions, if we're helping the listing agent, we can mm -hmm. offer the transaction coordination services. We can rent from an attorney standpoint. We can mm -hmm. rent the seller. And then the buyer is going to close the transaction somewhere else, and that works just fine as well. And honestly, being an attorney, we have a little bit more kind of weight to throw around with a buyer's attorney in terms of like reviewing disclosure, you know, we're reviewing settlement statements, make sure all the ducks are in a row, making sure the seller documents were prepared. Mm -hmm. Uh, and making sure the client is, you know, well taken care of. And, and so. very often, you know, we're dealing with instances where sellers have already moved and left and we're just able to kind of like smooth all the details. So. Yeah, no, that makes a lot of sense. I love the idea. It obviously creates stickiness with you guys. And then, you know, are you able to charge for that on the, on the HUD or, you know, are you able to do that? So, yeah. yeah. It's, it's basically an attorney fee. It's just charged on the HUD and, and it gets kind of wrapped into other things. Eligible for closing costs, credits and the whole bit. So. Mm -hmm. It works out really well, and it tends to be a great leverage tool for agents who not only don't want to pay for someone in a full-time or even part-time capacity to try to do that work for them, but also don't have the wherewithal to train, recruit, hire. Worry about coverage if someone's on vacation, like, that sort of thing. Right. Yeah, we, we've got the resources for that. That's part of what we're good at, and so it, it's just kind of a natural match. Yeah. I've watched you guys grow very fast. What's next for Atlas Arch? I think uh, we have some really key partnerships we've been working on. Obviously, we want to give the best quality service possible. I don't know that we've ever led with quantity. I don't know that we ever will. I think the quality of service is really important to us. Honestly, we constantly ask ourselves, how big should we grow this? How big do we go? And that, I think, is a question that you ask yourself all the time, too. So I know I'm not asking. Yeah. We really want to focus on sustainable growth. And that's what the last year has been for us. We've continued to kind of grow in terms of the number of people here. And we continue to you know look for market share. But really, a lot of our focus is outside of our regional footprint and trying to get into North Carolina at large and seeing how we can leverage remote signing opportunities. And then hopefully over the next year or so, electronic closings, um, like fully electronic closings, which are coming to North Carolina. That's really where we have our eyes up at. It's but our big why is yeah. to not ever grow so far outside of our footprint that we can't have the culture that we have here because i think that that is the why behind everything that we do and so keeping sustainable growth making sure that we have the relationships within our building forever so a lot a lot of what kelly and i do and especially as we're looking at vision and what we want to do in the future is balancing the two things right balancing growth and opportunity, which we both love and we <laughs> seize on if we see it, yeah. but balancing that with making sure that we're not sacrificing anything in terms of the quality of the culture and the people out here, which is the why, right? That's the reason yeah. we're here. So It makes a lot of sense. I'm big fans of what you guys have done. You brought up remote closings or electronic signings. I've yes. been reading a little bit in North Carolina with some like different things where something didn't get approved. Where are we at with, with that? <laughs> Yeah, so uh, luckily, I, I serve on the North Carolina Committee for Electronic Mortgages. So the Secretary of State has a committee of like, it's probably 10 or so folks with only a couple of attorneys. And I'm lucky enough to serve on that committee. So I'm super plugged into it. 
have actually talked with the Secretary of State about kind of where this looks, where it's headed. Right now, there are there's a law in place that allows for electronic closings. So when we talk about electronic closings, we mean RON, remote online notarization. Sometimes in North Carolina, they call it remote electronic notarization, REN. RON basically is available in North Carolina. The problem is there's not a rule structure that backs it up. In other words, the Secretary of State is trying to work on passing the rules that will form the basis for being able to conduct them. And then to complicate things even further, they also defunded the project. So the folks who were supposed to be putting together those rules of governance to make the electronic closings happen got defunded. Yep. So basically they passed the law, this was a couple of years ago, and they defunded everything. And so they've been working on building up this infrastructure. What we've been told is next year is likely the rules will get passed. Um, Okay. I, when that was told to us most recently, I looked at the secretary and said, said okay, but are we for real this time? Like, are we, is this just another like bump out? And I got the sense that it was for real, um, that they're really looking at next summer as being the time when um, we'll be able to actually do remote online notarization in North Carolina. And we're ready for it. Yep. Um, we do electronic closings here through what's called IPEN, so in-person electronic notary, which is where the notary has to physically be in person, but there's no paper. So everything is done electronically. Mm-hmm. We're the first ones in the state to do those escrow tab. You know, we've, we've been kind of on the forefront of that. We'll continue to be on the cutting edge of it because that's what we like, honestly. It makes it easier on everyone, but, but also yes. I actually think it can be more mm-hmm. secure too because of the validation process. It's actually a better validation process than mm-hmm. scammers out there with fake IDs. Yeah, my, I mean, my other favorite thing is it does not allow for mistakes. The package is marked up everywhere that needs to be signed and initialed prior to a client even walking in the room, which is awesome because, you know, there is such a thing as human error. So sometimes mistakes get made in execution of a package at a table when it's paper. But if it's electronic, there is literally no way to progress unless you've signed everything, which is awesome. Is, was there pushback from the state or is it just they didn't get there? Like, and why was there pushback? What is the other side of it? Is it worried about the validation of identities or something else? You're going to love this answer. So before COVID, basically the, the directive from our state was it will never happen. And the reason it, it would never happen is because of what we started our conversation with. It's the old fogey attorneys that want to control. Yeah. And they wanted to sit yeah. down at the table and do this the, the way that they've always done it. And they want to get paid to do it that way. And when COVID came along, it became very apparent that that way of doing things was problematic. As as things have gone, COVID has really forced, I think, the, the state of North Carolina to really kind of change their view of it. So I think there was a lot of resistance early on. I know in our industry, there's a ton of resistance and it's going to take some time before lenders and agents and especially attorneys get comfortable with it, but it won't take us very much time. We're ready for it. Let's yeah. let's go get it. All right, hey, rapid fire section. I'm gonna I'm gonna say one one person answer the first question. You guys jump in between. What's your favorite part of the closing process? My favorite part of the closing process is getting them to know the client's needs. So we always have some crazy stories that happen and getting to know what is important to the buyer client when we meet them at the table is my favorite part because you never know and sometimes you're surprised. There is nothing like getting to the end of a closing and the client going, well, that was way easier than I thought it was going to be. Mm-hmm. That, that is, there's nothing like no bigger compliment for us than that. No, I, I will say the uh, the Google reviews that come through, it's like, yes, yeah. yes we're doing something right. Yeah. You know, when you can tell, like, people are actually taking the time yeah. to write something that's positive mm-hmm. on a closing. That's an uh, exciting part of the business. Yeah. What's a mistake you made early in your career that you'll never forget? Ooh, I have a real estate story on a big mistake that I made. So I was a baby agent. I was just learning the ropes, and I was repping the sweetest buyers on their first home purchase. And we use showing time in North Carolina to schedule all of our inspections and such. And the home that they were buying was in a rural area and it had a um, septic tank. So we had to do a septic inspection for lender. So I get everything scheduled, ready to go. Septic inspector goes out, digs the hole, checks everything, all good, moving on. I get a phone call from a listing agent later in the day. Listing agent goes, there is a hole in my seller's yard. 
And I was unaware that you were having a septic inspection today. And I was mortified because I had forgotten to go into showing time and notify the listing agent that that inspection was going to happen. I will never forget it because it just further intensified my fear as an agent yeah. of all of the things I needed to be taken care of. But it also was really eye-opening because it helped me remember, like, every single time I do a transaction, I'm going to learn something. I spent eight years of my career kind of pushed down a culture of don't make a mistake, don't make mistakes, mm -hmm. don't make mistakes. And since we have started Atlas, and even a little bit before, Kelly and I have really kind of embraced this idea idea that we want our people to go out and make mistakes. We want them to go make mistakes that cost us money because the biggest, we've made a lot of mistakes in doing that. And we every week we, find, we figure out a new mistake that we made and we learn from that mistake and we really iterate on that. And it's created this kind of cultural people don't, they're not scared here. They don't work. Like, and most attorneys, law firms, like everybody's scared of making mistakes. People here don't feel that way. And when they make a mistake, we learn from it as a group and then we get better. And so we we think we have a much better product because of that. So my answer to your question is, made, the mistake I made was not making mistakes. Oh, no, it actually is a great answer. And it comes from the leadership, I think, of the team, because I was at an organization one time where it was like, well, what happens if it doesn't work? I was like, and we learn, yeah, we got to give it a shot. Is there something on your bucket list item? that you really want to check off, what would it be? So as we say here, we actually have a plan trip that we were supposed to go on last week to Scotland. So Joe and his wife, Chelsea, and my husband and I, we were all supposed to go to Scotland together last week. And that is very much on the bucket list. We were all really excited to go. And it just was not meant to be for us last week, I guess. Uh, we are- So you booked everything and then you couldn't go? Thousands of dollars spent on this trip. Oh. Child care set up for my kids, everything ready to go. We get to the airport and the first flight is canceled due to weather. We rebook for the following day. We literally get on the flight. And well, we drove. We drove. Yes. So we drove to D.C. from so North Carolina. Oh my God! We the flight. We're on the flight. So we're we're in the air on the way to Edinburgh. About a about an, an hour, hour in. in. About an hour and in. They, they come, come on from the flight deck and they go, "Hey guys, we're flying on a backup system right now." <laughs> And we're going to turn this thing around. Turn this thing around and go back to the Oh, bus. my God. So, oh, yeah. Yeah. At that point, we couldn't extend the trip because we just couldn't make it work with work. And we were going to only be in Scotland for three days at that point after two canceled things. <laughs> yeah, we, so that's I our mean, bucket list. That's, there's a, that will pop right into my brain. We So it's funny, Lani. I'll, I'll speak for myself. Maybe you agree with this. I don't really have a crazy bucket list. We very much operate on a, like, see the opportunity to go get the opportunity. And we try not to say no. Yeah. Like, we really, really do try not to say no. That's true. Um, yeah. And so I don't know. I, I don't know about you, but, but collectively, if like we have a bucket list item, it's a short-term deal, right? It's yeah. a, I want to try to get this in the next six to 12 months. All right. Final question. What's the most confusing or tricky clause or fact in real estate that you've ever had to explain to a client? I'd say the most common one that happens all the time is explaining to people easements and right of way. We deal with a lot of complicated title problems. I got so, a complicated order. Yeah, I mean, trying to explain, North Carolina has a really weird thing with marital interests. So if you die in North Carolina, your spouse has the right to elect a one-third life estate in all property you own while you're married, and which is a crazy, crazy law. You know, it comes from the old days of uh, dower and curtsy so it's it's really trying to explain that to a real estate agent why or a client why their spouse sure. has to sign is something we do on a weekly basis and is still impossible i've been doing it 12 years and that's still it. <laughs> that's a great answer yeah. yeah and then i mean my husband is a prime example we were looking at some vacant land recently and it has an access issue so it's a landlocked parcel does not have any access and trying to explain that to someone in like layman's terms of like hey there's no access and my husband goes well why can't we just make a road <laughs> like that's not how that works you know you'd be accessing the property through someone else's parcel so you have to get an easement or you have to have you know permission to do that that's always really fun to explain and that happens a lot yeah <laughs> that does we, we so title issues that kind of thing 
The other thing is, I would say, just generally speaking, older agents that maybe don't understand what we say when we're talking about a remote closing or like mm-hmm. how how we conduct a remote yes. settlement and what that's like. Oh, the attorney's not going to be physically there. Um, trying to trying to help uh, agents understand that and feel comfortable with it. And you said it earlier in, in the I guess like once they've done it once, they go, oh my gosh, this is the best thing. This is the best way to yeah. do it. Why are we not doing it this way? Um, but sometimes getting them like to come, to get all the way to the water and to take a drink is hard. Like you really have yeah. to drag. What a breath of fresh air. It's great seeing you guys. We enjoyed our time with you guys when you came up here. Love working with you all. You guys have been great to us while we've been down there. I, look, we're not for everyone, but you guys have been great to us. So thank you. <laughs> thank you, Lavi, for Thanks, having Lavi. us. So we much fun. It. Yeah. Hey. For uh, for those out there that want to you know check out your website, get to know you, what's what's the web address? Yeah, web address is atlas-orange.com, and then we can be found everywhere: TikTok, Instagram, Facebook at Atlas Closings. Yeah, come follow us on Atlas Closings. That's the place to be. <laughs>